Praise the Lord, church. As we make our way in, can we come with a lifted voice and lifted hands and let's just begin to magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can we do that this evening? Lord, we love you today. We thank you, Jesus, for meeting us here. You said where two or three are gathered together in your name. There you are in the midst. So, God, we've come expecting you. God, we've come to hear you and to see you and be touched by you and to touch you. In Jesus' name, Lord, we love you and we magnify you. Oh, come, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Has he been, has he been good to anybody? Has he been good to you? Did he wake you up out of bed this morning and give you breath in your body? Let's clap our hands and lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, God. We invite you, if you have a need in your body, please come forward at this time. We'll pray with you, and let's worship as they sing. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Go tell it on the mountain. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you thankful we know that good news that Jesus came and he was born in Bethlehem and he came and died for you and me and every day is Christmas, but we're celebrating it today. But thank God for Calvary and thank God for Bethlehem. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, I got a challenge for you. In this unique circumstance where I can see seemingly more pew than people, we got three minutes. We're going to shake hands challenge is you got to shake everybody's hand in three minutes. Go.
Amen. Did anybody win? Brother Ainsworth won. Look at him. He's doing a victory lap. Just kidding. Well, listen, it's really good to see everybody uh, tonight and uh, right here before Christmas. It's such a good time to get together right before the big shindig, you know. So, But anyway, listen, we got just a few announcements. I'm going to let you be seated for just a couple minutes here. Give my speech. Just kidding. All righty. So coming up, Wednesday, December 29th, we have foot washing and communion. Please remember, bring your own towel. They will not be provided. Uh, so that's actually uh, the 29th. And then Sunday, January 2nd at 6 p.m., that's going to be the communion. So let me clarify that. Wednesday, the 29th, is foot washing. Bring your own towel. And then Sunday, January 2nd at 6 p.m., is going to be communion. It'll be a good, good time. Uh, also, in the foyer, you will find this calendar. There are all kinds of classes that are coming up in the month of January. You do not want to miss out, and you do not want to get things mixed up. So I highly recommend getting the calendar and staying in tuned that way. And if you would, please stand back with me as the ushers make their way forward. We're going to worship the Lord in our giving. Uh, there are three ways in which you can do so. You can drop an envelope in the tithing uh, baskets here. You can also text to give at the number provided on the screen, and you can give online as well. Let's lift our voice and pray over this offering. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity to give into your kingdom. We ask that you would bless this gift and the givers alike. Lord, bless it to increase your kingdom, Lord, so that we can use it to further your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship with the praise team one more time. Come on, why don't we praise him right now? Amen, amen. Aren't you thankful for his presence? Thank you so much, praise team. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here. I know it's a little crowded tonight. I apologize. I, 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 you know, I wish everybody could spread out, but unfortunately just don't have the room. You know, I know we have so, we, we actually have a lot of people that are sick. Thankfully, many, many, many went and tested and all tested. I actually, I was around so many people, I went and got tested. First time I've been positive about being negative. And, uh, but sinuses, this and that, and my goodness, the weather doesn't know what it wants to do. It is extremely confused. If you were dreaming of a white Christmas, then I hope you're planning on traveling because it's going to be 80 degrees and sunny here. That's all right. I'm going to turn the air extremely low on my 
air conditioned, and I am going to have a fire on Christmas Day. It is going to be hot outside, but it is going to be chilly inside, and I'm, even if it's just for 30 minutes, because I don't want to pay that bill all day long, but for just long enough to have a fire in the fireplace, but we are going to do that. Also, I know many, many, many are traveling. I've gotten so many texts, Pastor, we're heading out right now. And I had several, I've talked to some other pastors, like, you know, we're canceling everything. And uh, we are only having one service on Sunday. Uh, Sunday morning we'll be having service. And I, I know many are still, there are going to be so many out of town. I know that. I understand that. And I've talked to so many other pastors. And they're like, well, we're just canceling on Sunday. And I just, I have a hard time canceling church to celebrate Jesus. It just it seemed, uh, not, you know, if, if you know somebody in there is just, hey, we're not knocking anybody else. I just, it, it seems a little strange to me that, you know, we want to, he's the reason for the season, so we're not going to have church. So I know it, it is small and nothing against those that are traveling and especially those that are sick and trying to be careful uh, of others. We understand that nothing, it, but I am thankful for those of you that are here tonight. We did move it to a Tuesday so that you would have more time to travel. The roads are going to be very busy. I know many of you even I've already talked to that will be traveling. Please be careful. Come home safe. We're look, looking forward to that. But I tell you what, I still love being in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I'm so thankful to be in the house of the Lord this evening. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to read one scripture, and then I'm going to let you be seated, and I'll read some more. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. We're going to have a time of prayer at the end of service. Uh, I don't feel that I'll be very long. I don't feel that, but I haven't ever felt that many times when I was long-winded, so, but uh, I will be mindful of that, but we do want to have a time at the end of service, a time of prayer, and uh, be praying over all those that are sick as well and those that are traveling. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old from everlasting. And it goes on further. It says, Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, that they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. Lord Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful for you, not during just this season, but every day of every week of every month, we are thankful for you. And Lord, I ask that you would be with every family member, all those that are traveling, all those that are sick. God, I ask that you would speak to every person that is here tonight, those watching online. Whatever it is we're going through, whatever situations, help us to realize that your hand is in everything and that we can trust you and that you will accomplish everything that you have promised. We love you. We worship you. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you are going to do. Please have your way in this service in your precious name, Jesus. We pray pray and everyone said amen amen in case anybody's nervous about handshaking just wave to somebody and you can be seated wave to a couple of them i mean you can almost cover everybody and you may be seated we read this scripture right here and we read the prophecy that there is going to be a child that is born in bethlehem and that when the mother travails and the child comes forth, that he will stand in the power of God and will free the people, will draw the nation back. We read this prophecy, and all of it's going to happen in Bethlehem. And then we get to Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, and it says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou 
that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind, wondering in her mind, what manner of, of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Following the same prophecies. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And so we get, we get from here, we, we see this, we see this prophecy. Now we've got a prophecy that there's going to be a baby born in the house of David, going to come out of, and is going to be born in Bethlehem. Now Mary has received her prophecy, and then you get to Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, and it may be a little lengthy, but if you can't read the Christmas story around Christmas time, my goodness, when, when else do you read it? I suggest we read it all, all through the year. But Luke chapter 2 verse 1, And it came to pass in those days... There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, or to Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph with the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So many times we read this, there is something, I've mentioned it one other time previously, I've never really gotten into all of it, and don't have time to get into all of it tonight, but there is so many things that happen here, and this story right here, before Jesus has done his first miracle, before we see him walk on water, before he breaks the bread and feeds the 5,000, before, he, before he heals the first 
blinded eye before he opens the first deaf ears, before he heals the first dead person, before he calls Lazarus out of the grave, before any of these miracles happen, before the upper room takes place and before his, before the Holy Ghost is poured out, his spirit is poured out, before baptism in Jesus' name is even something they're talking about, before we ever arrived here, before your situation showed up and before your problem showed up and before you drew your first breath on this earth and before you first became old enough to know that the world is not a perfect place and tragedies and problems and situations happen, before somebody broke their very very first promise to you, before the first time you were stabbed in the back, before the first time that your heart was broken or before the first time you buried somebody you loved or said goodbye to somebody and, and a relationship was destroyed, before humanity lost their high place in your mind, before the first time you found out people lied and people would hurt you, before the first time you found out that life will scar you, before the first time you doubted that maybe God would make a way, before that doubt ever crept into your mind, the miracles were already happening. Before all of that, there was a man that knew The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And before you ever got to the point you are today, some of you battling things that you've prayed for for years, wondering how is God going to fix this? Some family so ripped apart and this season is not going to be anything joyful. In fact, you're trying to figure out what you're going to do on that day or Christmas day or what you're going to do when the family all gets together or maybe you're one that's going to be celebrating alone or maybe you're one that doesn't want to celebrate at all or maybe you're looking, not really looking forward to but you're going to be having awkward conversations with people that you've got situations with in your family, or maybe it's a broken family trying to somewhat figure out a way to share this holiday season together, or maybe it has nothing to do with this season. It's just life in general has handed you some situations, and you don't know. Yes, I come up for prayer, and yes, I've prayed about them, and yes, I know the promises of God, and yes, I know God is faithful, but 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 sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where if, we, if we've lived any time at all, we find ourselves going through in our mind saying, I just don't know how he's going to fix this one. Maybe this is one of the ones we've got to learn to live with. Maybe this is one of the ones that, you know, is for my good and I just don't see it. Maybe I'll quit praying for this one because I prayed for so long and it had not happened. Or maybe you find yourself in a situation where the pieces are so scattered, it doesn't look like this puzzle's ever coming back together. Can I tell you, before you ever got to that place, there are some things in Scripture that give us hope. And there are some things that are not in the Scripture that are tied to Scripture. And it all works together to give us faith in every single situation. I believe God moves in everything. See, you have to understand, the Bible says that God sets men up and he sets them down. He sets up kings. He sets up rulers. Can I tell you, God's hand is in everything. Well, my boss don't go to church. God's hand is in everything. Well, well, they don't know my situation. God's hand is in everything. Well, these people don't go to church. God's hand is in everything. Well, this hasn't happened. And that God's hand is in everything. In fact, our biggest issue in life is not wondering how God's going to do what he does. Our greatest, our greatest struggle and our greatest battle is staying in his hand while his hand is moving in everything. A, a lot of our situations, the, the reason they don't turn out is not because God's hand is not moving through the fabric of time in every situation, but we literally take ourselves out of the hand that is moving with, with with a desired result and well I God this didn't happen not because his hand quit moving the Bible says his arm is not slack concerning his promises he is mighty to say he, there is nothing that he can do the Bible says with, that, with God nothing is impossible and all of that starts in Micah. One of my favorite stories in the Bible hardly mentions all of the things surrounding it. I did not come to appreciate it until I got into history class. I, I'm a history buff. I love to find out things. I've been on the phone a lot this week trying to find out where my family came from here and where my family came from there. Many of you may not know, you know, 
Brother Russell, Brother Thomas Russell, Brother Tom Russell that passed away here uh, uh, last year or beginning of COVID, and Sister Virginia Russell that still goes here. We were sitting there talking the other day, and she said, well, you know, I'm from this part of Missouri. I said, well, hold on. My family's from that part of Missouri. And so I called her son. I said, do you know any of these Lewises? He said, my wife's a Lewis, and she's from here. And so I've been on the phone today, and it, it looks like our, our, our great-grandfathers, or our, my, I'm sorry, it would be my great-great-grandfather is the same. We haven't had that conversation. And she's telling me all these names, and I called my uncle today, and he's telling me he knows all the names. It's just amazing. Who would have ever thought all of these years and all? It's just amazing what God can do. It's amazing how many things are tied together. But history is something that I'm very into. And you see, it seems like an ordinary scripture. And I imagine when when Micah says these things, he says, it's just one verse, but thou Bethlehem. He says, though you're little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel. It's It's just one line. But there is a world of impossibility between that line because Joseph is in Galilee and Nazareth. He's not in Bethlehem. He doesn't want to go to Bethlehem. He has no reason. So we've got a baby that needs to be born, but the prophecy says that the baby's going to be born in Bethlehem. But Joseph and Mary are over here in Nazareth. How much does God care about every promise that goes? The Bible says, he tells some of them, he says, not a word that comes out of your mouth will fall to the ground. Is, does God promise us things just so sliding and just so offhand? Hopefully it comes. Is, is it like what you maybe told your kid? Maybe you'll get that. Maybe I'll give you this gift. Maybe, but in, in your mind, you're like, maybe. You know how that means. That maybe means no. We'll see means no. In fact, just about everything but yes means no. But God ain't like us. He is not a man that he should lie. How much does he care about one verse out of thousands, hundreds of thousands? What does he care about that one little promise he made to you? What does he care about that one prayer that you prayed that was overshadowed by 8.3 billion people and their prayers. One promise made to you, just one person on one little continent, in one country, in one state, in one city, with all the others. Just how big of a deal is it when he promises something? And before they even existed, the hand that moves through time goes to work. See, at this time, in September 23rd, 63 B.C., there is a child that is born. Long before Jesus is born, there is another one that is born. Gaius Octavius Thurinius is born on September the 23rd. He is called by his friends Octavius until later on, as he grows, he's known as Octavian. What in the world does that have to do with Jesus? That's what we're thinking right now. Kind of like right now when we're in the situations in our life, those of you that are watching, maybe sick in your body, those that are listening, thinking, what in the world, how in the world does everything come together? Can I tell you, there are things going on in your world right now. You have no clue that God is working it for your good to fulfill his promise. But it does, it's not even on the spectrum right now. You see, something begins to happen because then later on in 44 B.C., Octavius, who becomes Octavian, is adopted by his uncle, a very well-known man named Julius Caesar. When he is adopted, Gaius Octavius Thurinius, is be, he, uh, known as Octavian, takes on a new name. And he becomes Gaius Julius Caesar. Still doesn't make a lot of sense until his uncle, Julius Caesar, is assassinated. He become, uh, I forget how you say it, I think it's triumvirate, the first triumvirate, 
Julius Caesar, he gets with all with two other people and they, they make a bond and they make a pact and they go to war with these other powers and they defeat them. And Julius Caesar becomes this, this ruler over, over so much and he has so much power and he has a friend. He actually, Shakespeare writes a play about him called Julius Caesar, only Shakespeare gets it wrong. And Shakespeare, and you probably don't want to know any of this, and care less. In Shakespeare's play, there is a man named Marcus Brutus. They call him Brutus, and he is known to betray Julius Caesar. In real life, Marcus Brutus was not even trusted. It was actually Decimus that betrayed him more than anybody. And he gets, see, politicians, they've been dirty for a long time. Decimus is a senator, and he gets the other senators all together, and they stab. All of them come up, and they stab. I forget how many times Julius Caesar is stabbed and assassinated. He must be a good-looking fellow. He's married to this little-known lady called Cleopatra. So he had several things going for him. When his uncle is killed, Octavian becomes extremely angry. And he gets help from two of his friends, one Mark Antony and the other Lepidus. His, actually, his, his whole name is Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. And he gets them together and they form the second triumvirate. And that is their, their allegiance with each other. They make a pact with each other. And they go to war. And they start making everything right. And they, they assassinate everybody that was involved in the assassination. Anybody that was against his uncle, they go after. They kill. They do this. They take over everything. And man, all of a sudden, they've got all the power. They've conquered everything there is. And then Lepidus, he gets a little upset. And he tells Octavian, you need to get out of Italy. Well, then they overpower Lepidus and Octavian does that. Then he gets mad at his best friend, Mark Anthony. In fact, he loves Mark Anthony so, Anthony so much that he helps him marry his sister, Octavius. Octavia, yeah, Octavia is his name. Octavia was her name, if I remember correctly. And so Mark Anthony marries his sister, but apparently his sister wasn't enough. He divorces, Mark Anthony divorces Octavian's sister and ends up marrying his uncle's widow, Cleopatra. And they decide that Cleopatra's illegitimate son, uh, Caesarian, is supposed to be the real rightful ruler of Rome. So Octavius gets so upset, he goes to war with both of them. Cleopatra brings her army. Mark Anthony brings his army. And they say there's no way that Octavian can win. He has to fight the battle on two fronts, and that's impossible. But in spite of all the odds against him, and in spite of what every single person says should not have happened, Octavian wins the battle, defeats Mark Anthony, and defeats Cleopatra. You're probably are like, what in the world are we doing? That's, that's how the enemy feels right and that's how God feels and they look and you have no idea that two things so far away are connected what in the world does that have to do with anything and the price of tea in China when Octavian defeats Cleopatra and he defeats Mark Anthony he becomes for the first time the supreme ruler over all of Rome all of its countries in the area over everything he's a great politician so he goes to the senate and humbly gives them back all of the power well then when Octavian does that it so makes an impression on the senate that they turn right back around and they give him the honorary term Augustus, which means the illustrious one. And they make him imperator, which in our word is emperor. And he changes his name. And in 27 BC becomes Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, the most power any has ever had. Why does that matter? Because not just anybody could tell an entire country where to go to pay their taxes and where they needed to do it and when they needed to do it because they could not agree on anything. The only way that there could be a decree that would go throughout all of the land and it would impact everybody is if there was one ruler who had the decision-making 
power over everybody. And that had never existed until one day the Senate, because of his impressive victories, names one man ruler over all of Rome and the first emperor steps on the scene and that is Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus. And in a way to make sure everybody knows he's the boss, he asked for a tax and he says, not only will you pay a tax, he didn't even know why he was saying it. He said, but you've got to go back to the town you were born in to pay your tax. History is going on. People are taking ships across seas and across oceans. Battles are being waged. That one prophecy is fulfilled. All of this happens. That one man can stand up and say, hey, the baby's got to... Why, God, why are you allowing all that to happen? Because the, the promise says the baby's got to be born in Bethlehem. If nothing changes, the baby's going to be born in Nazareth. And the prophecy doesn't say a thing about that. The prophecy says the baby's going to be born in Bethlehem. So we're going to... He don't even... The baby ain't even born yet. Mary hadn't even been given her promise yet. And before the promise even shows up, God is moving things together He sets men up and he sets them down. He allows one to move off the scene and he brings another one on the scene. Why? Because God cares about every promise. All of these things happen. One scripture. Well, that's just too much for me. That's because you don't think like God thinks. There is nothing that he would... Do you realize all the people that have been born, all the people that have died, all that has happened in life, and before you ever got to this point, the Bible says before the foundations of the world, the lamb was already slain. That means before you ever ran into your situation that you didn't think you could get out of, God said, don't worry. There are so many things that have happened before you got here because I knew there was going to be a need, and I made you a promise, and so I have went through the tapestry of history to make sure that everything I ever promised you is going to be there. What are you saying? I'm just trying to tell somebody tonight, I don't know what God promised you. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what your situation looks like. But I'm telling you, if God can go through all of that and allow all of that to happen so that a scripture is fulfilled and a baby is born in Bethlehem instead of Nazareth so that the prophecy of one man given one time in a little bitty town is brought to fulfillment, can I tell you, he cares about every thing he's promised you that night when you were sitting there and you prayed and God began to tell you what he was going to do and God began to speak to you it wasn't just a little thing it wasn't like a magazine you read it wasn't like your friend talking to you it wasn't like your daddy or your mom no when God speaks let me tell you not a single word is for nothing not a single word falls to the ground if he said he's going to do it I promise you he's going to do it our job is not to know the when and not Hey, I couldn't put that together if I wanted to. I couldn't think up a plan that elaborate. I couldn't make it up in my mind. I couldn't dream it up. But God's ways are higher than my ways, and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I'm so glad I don't have to understand it. All I have to do is say, God, while your plan is making its way, I just want to stay in the hand that is drawing up the plan. I don't have to know the plan. I just got to stay in the hand. I don't have to know how it's going to work out. I just got to be led by the hand. Just stay in the hand. Come on. I don't know when your healing's coming. Just stay in his hand. I don't know what's going to happen next week. Maybe this year ain't the year. Maybe it'll be next year. I don't know who's going to get elected. I don't know what's going to happen in your job. What I can tell you is if you would just stay in the master's hand. Oh. Musicians, you can get ready. My, that's your, your first gift. I'm hoping, you know, if I quit when I'm planning, it'll be a gift. If not, see the difference between me and God. My plan went different. I started preaching. I never thought I'd leave Port Arthur. Now, granted, you... If you know Port Arthur, you're like, you mean that wasn't your number one plan in life, leaving? You have to understand, that's where I grew up. I still love it. 
I'm not proud of all the places in there. So, but I love it. It's my hometown. It'll be that long as I live. I love it. I love the memories. I love the people. It's my family. The church people there, it's, they, they, they raised me. It's, it's, it's my family. I never thought I'd leave. I told people I'd never leave. We started preaching. We started going to different places. We preached 15 minutes that way, 10 minutes that way, 20 minutes that way, 30 minutes that way. I have preached all over this place. We had a pastor came, said, hey, he said, uh, once you come, once you to come here, you're going to be pastor here. I thought, man, that, that's a great opportunity. That's where we're going. My goodness, that's where we're going. Didn't happen. Couldn't feel it. It just, it just, it just something going on. We got another place. They said, hey, we want you to put your name in. It's a great church. This is how much they're going to pay you. This, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, we, it got, you know, carnal real quick. I, I don't even know. I will, it don't even matter the rest. My goodness, we can change the rest with that. We got there. and We got there. They said, hey, we already voted. We already took a vote. Church voted 100%. And, uh. All you got to do is say yes, and you'll be the pastor. My wife and I, we're like, oh, my goodness, they got a deer lease. Right. Guy came up and said, hey, I already got your place on the deer lease right down here. Here's a picture of the buck. If you know me, you know. <laughs> I was picking out deer stands for I was houses. I said, that's, that's the will of God. If there ever was a will of God, it's the will of God. I saw it. On, I was, my goodness, that was a good buck. He said, oh, this is going to happen. Here's the house. Here's this. My all you got to do is say yes. Well, man, I got there, and it was on a Friday night, and I said, man, this, this is it. I'm ready to say yes. My wife said the same thing. Oh, my goodness. We got there. I went, and I met with them. The, they were all sitting in the back, the group of men that were choosing. Man, we had a great service that night. I some pr- got the Holy Ghost, prayed through, got baptized, went back there, and I went to say yes, and my stomach went, I'm like, oh, what in the world? I was just sick to my... I said, you know what, let's talk Sunday morning. Boy, Sunday morning, we had blowout church. We had two get the Holy Ghost. That morning, we baptized two. I was like, this, if that ain't a sign, there ain't never been a sign. I told my wife, I said, this is it. This is where we're going. I walked into the office to talk to those men, and my stomach just clenched. Up, and I, I mean, I just get instantly so sick. I said, let's talk tonight after the service tonight. That night, a backslider prayed through. My wife told me, she said, honey, the Bible says follow peace, and that's not what peace feels like. I said, I know, but I want it to be. I went in there and the same thing happened. I told those men, I said, I can't come here. I want to with all my heart. It makes so much sense. But there's something. We left. I'm like, what are we going to do? We're living out of a travel trailer. Now we're doing this. I thought that was it. thought we had forever. And we got another call. And they said, hey, we want to go. You want you to go over to Dallas. You're going to do this right here. We looked at the building. Well, I was like, oh, my goodness. Show me my office. He said, you're going to take over this. I said, oh, my goodness. We started praying about it. My wife and I both on the trip up there to meet with them and plan out where we were going to go. I said, baby, I don't understand. This is the third time. This don't make sense. She said, I know, I feel it too. We had that discussion. They were very gracious. They understood completely. Still friends till this day. Love them very much. We left there. We went to another place. We were asked to go there. And, and, and man, prayed about it. It's such a great opportunity. Didn't feel it. Had another one. The church was just, I think at that time it was 800. And man, I was like, well, if there's ever been a will, that, that's it right there. It's kind of, it, it, it could not for the life of me feel it. I, I don't, this don't make any sense. Had another one went to preach, and then that one, I said, baby, maybe this. That they said, would you please, would you consider coming here? We'd love to have you. Went and preached for them. Just could. I said, man, I want to. I just I don't have any peace for it. Then a man told me, said, hey, I'd I love for you to preach for my dad. I want you to meet my dad. I said, sure. These seven churches we've looked at, and this was, we didn't know what else to do. And so uh, we had another offer that were there, and the guy mentioned something. And so we sat down with the man, and he said, uh, he, he said, I just feel like I'm supposed to meet with you. And so we said, well, we're confused. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Am I making it hard on God? He said, let's write down all the places that right now you can go. And I think it was eight places. He said, man, and we, we started praying. God moved right there in that room. He said, can I do something and you not get mad at me? I said, sure. He went up there, and he wrote the number nine. 
And he said under it, the unknown. He said, I don't know why I feel. I don't know what that means. And But I said, God, I trust you. We went. We told everybody we couldn't. The one person we thought we were really going to go, we sat down with them said, look, we love you to death. We told everybody there, we can't go. We don't know what it is God has, but that there's something out there, and, and we're going to let God do whatever he wants to do. Well, that man wanted me to meet his dad. His dad was Brother Jerry Green in Porter, Texas. We made to that camp meeting. Brother Green, what, wants you to preach? Okay. Man, I'd love to come preach for you. Where, where are you going this week? You know, he, I told him the next week I was preaching for somebody. He said, oh, okay. Well, they'll probably let you out of it. They'll let you cancel. <laughs> I said, huh. I said, man, I, I'd never met him. I'd never met him in my life. I said, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll ask the guy tomorrow night. And the next night I asked the, uh, I asked the other pastor. I said, hey, hey, you know, I know we've got this plan, you know, but I had another minister ask me if you'd be okay with us rescheduling or canceling so I could be with him next week. He said, no, no, we've had this plan. No, I want you here. He said, who is it? I said, it's uh, Brother Jerry Green and Porter. He said, oh. He said, hmm. He said, you better cancel me. And he's always picking on me. So I said, well, oh, come on. You're... He said, no. He said, I just felt something in my spirit. He said, one word, forever. He said, you, you got to go to Porter. I'm like, okay. That next morning, I was sitting there. I was at Cracker Barrel in Lufkin, Texas, sitting there on the corner table. My dad right there, and we're talking. I said, this happened on Thursday night, and this happened last night. You think that's God? And that, my dad's like, well, I, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. I said, well, something else happens. Third time's a charm. Got my fork. Got a bite of my pancake. Is when I was on a diet. I usually have waffles. No. I got a bite, went to put it in my mouth, and a man tapped me on the shoulder. said, are you, you Brother Joel McCoy? I said, yes. Yeah. He said, oh, man, I wish you'd come preach in our church. I said, oh, what church do you go to? And Brother Richie Pate told me. He said, I go to Brother Jerry Green's in Porter. And that's when I met Brother Richie and Sister Stacy. They thought they were having small talk. They, just, they didn't know they was messing up my whole breakfast. They walked off. I told my dad, I said, does that count? He said, Bubba, that counts. You better go to Porter. So I got ready, got everything ready. I thought Porter was next to Victoria. I had a long trip planned out that morning. We got up real, real early, put in the thing. I said, baby, poor, poor, Porter's only an hour and a half away. We don't need five hours. It, it's not near as far. I had no idea where Porter was. So we got to sleep in a little bit. We got dressed. First thing I saw, we started getting to Porter's, I saw the water burger. See, that's where I stopped every time I drove through. I didn't even know this place. Was, I thought this was an extension of Humble. I didn't know Porter existed over here, but I didn't know that water burger. Don't forsake the old landmarks. We pulled in. I didn't, I'd never known it existed. I heard about it all my life. Never knew it existed. First service. That Sunday night, I can remember he looked over because I was sitting right. No, I actually, no, we were sitting right here. We used to sit right here and look, look at you like this. He leaned right over. He said, I'm going to call you, and when I call you, I want you to come. I said, sure, that's always a good thing for an evangelist when you, somebody tells you they're going to call you back. That's good. I think we're supposed to come in August. And everything was going crazy, and in the last week of July, Last week of July, I had a man called me that Sunday. He said, you know what? I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to move our date around so we can do so. I said, that's fine. I don't even know if I've ever told you this. My wife and I sitting there. I said, you know what? I'm going to pray. If I'm supposed to go to Porter, I wonder if he's going to call me. And I, let's pray that he has us come this week. I'm not going to feel that Sunday. You called on a Thursday. I said, Brother McCoy, why don't you just come on and we'll start this week. Do you have anything? I said, no. So he said, why don't you come on and we'll start revival this week instead of next week. I said, okay, we'll go. I was here on the second week. 
And I was sitting there, and I told him, I said, Bishop, we, were, we had, a, I think it was seven weeks of revival we had. But on the second or third week, I told him, I said, look, I can't preach this week. I promised a guy in another state, I promised him two years ago that I'd come on this date. He's been asking me, and I've got to go. He, he said, I, and he honored that. He let me go. We got ready to go. I was on my way to the airport, me and my wife. He said, uh, bro, bro, he called me. He said, Brother McCoy. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh. When you get there, you, you wonder why what he says matters so much. And I'm, I'm coming to a close. He said, Brother McCoy, when you get there, that man's going to ask you to take his church. He said, Brother McCoy, don't do anything foolish. I just met him. I mean, we just, I didn't know him like I know now. He don't just talk ever. If he says, hmm, that matters, that means something. He said, uh. Bro McCoy, don't, don't give that man an answer. Tell him you'll pray about it. You do intend to pray about it, don't you, Brother McCoy? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I just felt it was the, there ain't nobody asking. I mean, come on. We didn't know each other like that yet. We got off the airplane. As soon as we got off the airplane, pastor's wife got my wife and took her that way. Pastor got me and took me this way. He showed me all over the town. He showed me this. He started showing me the daughter works. He drove by us by this massive house on three acres with the pictures of the monsters in the back of it, these big bucks. I mean, beauty. he said, this is going to be your home. We're giving you this home. That's where you're going to be. It's around six hundred and something thousand dollar home, beautiful home, three-story. I was like, oh, oh, if I ever seen the will of God. I'm sorry for a moment. I forgot everything you said. I apologize. I was sitting there. He finally brought us back to their house. We were sitting there. My wife came in. She's like, boy, we went to the back room. She said, baby, she, she's wanting us to come. I said, I know. I just talked to him. He told me, he said, we've been waiting. It's time for somebody to pass it down, and we want you to take this. I said, baby, this is it. And boy, we started talking. Da, 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 da. We, we kind of made up our decision. I don't think we prayed a single prayer. That was on a Thursday. We met. We were there that whole weekend. Had an incredible time. That Sunday night, they said, hey, we want to meet with y'all. Let's have this discussion. We were sitting in that back and that feeling. It came again. My wife said, hey, I, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. I went. We went back in that room. I said, baby, I got to tell you something. She said, sweetie. She said, this ain't it. I said, that's what I was going to tell you. She said, I have no peace. She said, I don't know what it is. I really thought this was it. I said, baby, I did too. Went back, told them, very gracious, still friends and everything. I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I don't know what's going on. Get here. And the next week, when he looked over, he said, you can't leave. Now, I thought that just meant staying in revival. But then later on, I found out that there was going to be a vote. There was going that there was a chance to be to be here and that he wanted us to be here. What are you saying? That's just a big no. I'm telling you, for nine years, and not nine years, for all of my life, I thought I had a plan. And before I ever drew my first breath, God was already. And I started looking at back over my life and I thought at any point. At any point, if I'd have just fought for my way, and if I, there's so many ways I could have, I could have missed it here, and I could have missed it here. But I, I, can, I can't tell you how many times we sit there at an altar. I can't tell you how many times we'd get the news that somebody else knew where there forever was. And my wife and I would go to an altar at a camp or at a church service and sit there and say, God, wherever it is, it's yours. And it was hard and it wasn't easy. We didn't know what the future holds. So many times trusting that God had a plan, even though I didn't know what it is. Can I tell you, it it wasn't just over here in a town of Bethlehem and it wasn't just in your life and it wasn't just in my life but what I have learned not only in scripture but in my own life is that God always has a plan and his plan is perfect not easy but it's perfect not always the easiest plan but it's perfect God's way is best he knows the way that we take and his way is perfect I don't know where you're at this morning I don't know what you're fighting 
pain. I don't know what's going on in your family, but I can tell you if you've been breathing on this earth for any time at all, you're going to find yourself in a place, God, I thought this was the plan, and I thought this is how it was going to work, and I thought for sure this was the avenue, and then you find yourself at a de- what looks like a dead end, or you find yourself, I just said where I thought I'd be at this age, and this isn't where I thought my family would end up, and this isn't where I thought this decision, can I tell you, don't give up on God, don't get, just stay in his hand, if you'll just stay in his hand, and allow him to keep moving, and to keep bringing things to pass, let him close the door he wants to close, so that he can open the ones that are right, I, it won't always feel good, but if you'll just trust him, and stay in his hand, I promise you, I promise you he's got you, would you stand to your feet, The story of the manger to me is one of the most encouraging stories in the world. To me, it's not just it's not just the shepherds and it's not just the angels singing and it's not just the wise men. To me, the greatest things that speaks to me outside of the birth of Jesus, the greatest thing that speaks to me is how he orchestrated out of nothing and brought everything into perfect alignment and when I read that story every year it gets me again and it reminds me to get back on the potter's wheel and let him keep working on whatever it is and to quit trying to figure out what makes sense to me but God not my way let me find my Gethsemane somewhere and let me to fall like you did and say not my will but thine be done not my way but your way not my thoughts but your thoughts God I- I'm going to get it wrong I'll get it twisted I may not even understand what you're doing but God just help me to stay faithful I promise you I can't tell you tomorrow everything in your life is going to be better I can't tell you that next week you're not going to face the greatest obstacle you've ever faced in your life I know we preach it every year but I can't tell you 21 is going to be the year of roses and I don't know what the future holds What I can tell you is that all things work together for the good. What's my job in that? All I got to do is love him. I've got to put him first. All things work together for the good of them that love him, that are called according to his purpose. All I got to do is keep him first and don't worry about where everything else lands. And I promise you, no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter what this season brings, the heartache, the tears, the good times, the smiles, it does, if you will just keep him first, if you'll stay faithful, I promise you on my life, He will make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. And when you get there, I promise you, it will make sense in the end. When he's done, you're not going to turn around and say, oh, I don't like this. No. When you finally turn around, you're going to say, oh, (laughs) every time I come in here, you don't know how much I love you. Every time I come in here, I'm thankful for every time I couldn't feel peace. I'm thankful for every closed door. I'm thankful for every time that I drove out of a church parking lot and God said, this ain't it. I'm thankful for every time my dream was crushed. And I'm thankful for every time it turned out to be a dead end. I'm thankful for every prayer where I prayed and begged God to let that be it. That he said, no, this is not it. Thank you for God for not letting me just settle somewhere. But thank you for ordering every step why don't we find somewhere tonight you can get your family together if you want I don't know what's going on in your life but I do promise you if you will stay faithful if you will stay faithful stay faithful to him stay faithful to his word I promise you you won't regret it I promise you no matter what it looks like right now he hasn't forgotten you he hasn't lost you along the way he hasn't forgotten where you are he is not unaware of your situation he is not unaware of what you're feeling he knows he knows he knows he knows and he has a plan he said I know my thoughts toward you Thoughts of good and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. That means every move he makes is with an end in mind. He has a plan. Right now, could we ask that God would have his way in our lives? 
That's the greatest thing we can do during this season is to remind ourselves he is in control. My job is to stay faithful, to stay submitted to his will. God, once again, would you lay your hand on our families? Could we pray for those that are sick tonight? Could we pray for those that are hurting tonight? Could we pray for every family tonight? Could you pray over your family, Dad? Mama, pray over your family. Kids, pray over your parents. God, let us stay in your will. Help us to stay in your plan. God, this year more than anything else, God, let us be perfectly in your will. Help us to surrender everything to your will. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my way, but your way. God, let this be a year where we follow wholly after everything you have for us. Let it be a year where we are completely submitted to your will so that we do not miss what you have planned for us. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand all over this place? You may say, well, Pastor, I already got out of the plan. He knew that too. It wasn't the plan that Adam and Eve would fail, but he had a plan for when they did what should have ended. He had a way of restoration. Maybe you find yourself like so many others in our world today. Pastor, there's some moves I, I can't take back. Can I tell you, he's so amazing. He's able to take the picture that you thought you destroyed, and he can even work the scars into the new picture. We're at, I remember I watched a guy once. We were at some sidewalk thing, and he was painting He was telling a story, and he painted this beautiful canvas. And it had this nice pond and beautiful plains. And he started describing the issues and the failures, and he started making all these cuts on it and these these strokes that just ruined the whole painting. And then he started talking about what God is able to do. It's a crazy thing that that long ago you could go to public venues like that and they were talking about those things as well. It's how far America has come. And he began to paint trees out of the scars. And out of the dark night, he put the moon and he started doing... It was a completely different picture. Every bit as beautiful as the first one. And it used every scar to add to it. Can I tell you that scripture that he, what the enemy meant for evil, God made for good. He meant it for good. 
every scar that you don't think you can live down, all you got to do is bring all the pieces back and bring it to the master's hand. Say, hey, it's got a lot of cuts. It's got a lot of scratches. And it ain't never going to look like what it can. God says, hey, it's going to be just as beautiful as it would have been. And I'm going to take all those things and I'm going to turn them into good. He still does it today. Don't give up because there's some scars. Don't give up because there's some things that should have been. Just get right back on the potter's wheel. Say, God, here, remake it however you want to. He's able. He's able. If there's anybody in here and the devil's been telling you lies and is trying to get you to give it up, if you find yourself just giving up because what's the use? That's a lie. Let God restore. It's what he does. The entire Christmas story, the entire story of Jesus is a story of restoration and the links that God will go to to save humanity. Not because he has to, but because he wants to. That didn't stop with the manger. It's still happening today. Let him do for you what he's done for so many others. Don't give up. Don't give up. Let him have it. Right now, there's just so many There's just so many with so many needs. Right now as a church family, can we pray over every family in this church? And maybe there's a family that's not in this church and you know their need. Pray over them too. They don't have to be here for us to pray over. If you know someone, this is going to be a very hard time. Maybe somebody that's lost a loved one or maybe somebody that's going through a trial. Can we just mention their name right now and ask that God would be with them? Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Lord, you're the only thing that can make things right. You're the only one that can turn it around. You're the only one that can heal the broken heart, mend the broken life. Lord, you know every need. Even when we're not aware of them, you know them. Some of them are watching and listening. Some of them are standing here tonight. And nobody has a clue what they battle and what they're dealing with. But you do, Lord. And I'm asking that you can do what nobody else can and that you would somehow heal every broken heart, every wounded spirit, every broken life. God, I'm asking that you would turn their sorrow, God, into joy. I'm asking that you would, as only you can do, turn their mourning into dancing. God, I'm asking that you would turn their situation around, bring peace in the middle of their troubled storm, bring restoration in the middle of their broken life, healing into their marriage, their home, their body. God, I'm asking that you would do what only you can do and touch every single one of those that are mentioned, those that are represented. God, we ask that you would do it right now in your name, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. I know you're going to have many wonderful times this week. You're going to have a great time. You're going, there's going to be opening of gifts. There's going to be meals. Would, would you... Take just a little bit bit of time. Those that are watching and listening, if they're not, that's fine. They they may already be off. That's fine. You can let somebody know. At least three. If you know of somebody that's going to be spending this time alone, or if you know of someone that's going to really be struggling, if you have time, hey, go by. You want to bring a gift? Hey, you can. But sometimes the greatest gift is just dropping by. Stop by and let them know you're thinking of them flowers, a card, whatever, or if just, just the gift of your time. Maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's 10 minutes, just to let them know, hey, we're thinking of you and we love you. Can, can we do that? The greatest lesson you could teach to your kids would it help them bring joy into somebody else's life. In fact, that's the greatest thing we could all do. It's, the, it's so over-commercialized, the best thing we could do in fact that would be in lines with the truest meaning of what this season represents or is supposed to represent would be giving unselfishly to somebody else being a light into their world making a difference in their life if you know of that person don't let's don't assume that somebody else will but let's go out of our way go meet with them if you know of somebody you can let myself know you can call sister tammy she's sick pray for her but you can let her know my wife know or any, any of the others, you can let Brother Ainsworth know. You can let Brother Isaac know, Brother Jory know. We, we've got ministers in here. Let them know, hey, I don't know if you're aware, but s- s- someone's going through this, someone's going through that. You can let Brother Mike Sell know. So great to have my father-in-law home. Oh, got him for a little while. Don't bother Brother Green. Just let me know. We're going to let him join. He'd tell you to let him know too. But 
Text us, let us know. We don't want anybody to go through this time without knowing that we love them. Amen. Amen. I love you so much. I love you. I'm so thankful for you. Those that are in town, looking forward. Sunday morning, God's going to move. I can't wait to see what's going to happen. Looking forward to great things. And, uh, of course, everybody's going to be here next Wednesday night for foot washing. The, probably the most packed out crowd of the whole year. So uh, that, that's going to be fun. Amen. It really, you know what? A lot of people don't do it. I know they don't. But the scripture says to do it. And many times I find myself needing to do the things I don't want to do the most. It still means something. It still matters. Well, when are we going to stop? We're not. We're not. Well, if two people show up, what if one shows up? Well, then I wash my own feet. Two show up. Me and Bishop will wash each other's. But I love you. God bless you. I'm so thankful for you. Please be safe. And I pray God keeps you safe on all of your travels. Not troubles, travels. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.